it's 1.30 p.m. in Lagos, 12.30 p.m. in London, and we're bringing you markets, analysis, and insights on Business Incorporated live from Channel's television here in Lagos. Here's what's coming up on the program. Global prices of vegetable oil still on the downtrend in 2023. Ethiopia plans to ramp up production of milk this year. South Africa says it needs an additional 14 billion rands to pay off its debt. Welcome to the program. I'm Will Ibang. Let's kick off with the markets. It's first up, as always, major equities in Africa where it was trading with mostly positive sentiments, except for Nigeria, and it's no brainer about that profit taking a set in now we see 0.2 percent down tick for equities investors are really mad at you know that frenzy is beginning to now you know step down a bit there we're still although we're still at the 70,000 uh, mark there but we see south africa bullish this at intraday 1.4 percent up and in egypt we see the egx 30 let's see how that performed 1.28 percent up at intraday uh, Kenya, the Nairobi Securities Exchange closed Wednesday's session in negative territory, second day in a row. Now, let's for more what's happening on the NGX, the floor of the NGX, we have Abdul Rashid Momo, equity trader, TRW Stockbrokers, to give us more insight. Good afternoon, Abdul Rashid. Good afternoon. Uh, Abdul Rashid, we're talking. <laughs> yes, we were talking earlier this morning, earlier today, and we we're talking about how the NGX hit the 70,000 level and what what trend I think the historical you were giving us that facts behind the figures but right now we're seeing this profit taking setting in are investors starting to get cautious are they rebalancing their portfolio what is happening at the moment you know generally for every rally there will always be a correction so what we are but what what, what we are experiencing is more of a correction I mean, this was an index that in the, within a period of, I think, three days, we had, we, I mean, the market gained for about 66, about 3,000 points in three days. That is huge. So what we are seeing mostly now is uh, more of correction. Um, yeah, prices are still stable. The banking sector seems to be, um, uh, we are, we are not seeing much price diff uh, drop. But they are they actually down, but the drops are not that heavy. But like what we see, what we saw uh, yesterday, you know, like yesterday we saw we saw stocks like uh, UBA get to about twenty one ninety five and close about twenty one naira. To today, is still within that same range, you know. Stand. So, well, for every rally we see, there always be a correction. So I think for now the rally we've seen for three days is beginning to um i think that rally is over for for now the market is going to take the correction we don't know how deep it's going to be but the good thing is that um in the long term um, from the chart we are seeing uh it's an upward channel as i've said um it's a bull bull yes uh, prices will least trade within the support and resistant level so we are seeing what they call the staircase formation where prices are moving higher highs and higher lows there's no threat to the bull trend in the long term even if the, this correction comes in and note that most of the q3s we have seen about the, i mean they've been very good so i think this might uh this might this will be a buffer for the market till uh, december period and next year uh, Abdul Rashid, we're getting news that the Central Bank of Nigeria, the CBN, has cleared the FX backlog with banks and airlines. That's a huge one if it's, it's going to be make a huge difference. But I want to know how much impact will that have on equities for today's close and what we'll see probably in the short to medium term if this really is true. No, sorry. I didn't get the first question. Sorry. I said you, the Central you, Bank, you we're getting that. news that the Central Bank of Nigeria has cleared the FX backlog with banks and airlines. That's, that news came in today, not long ago. And we're wondering what impact that will have for equities, especially for the FPIs, the foreign portfolio investors, uh, because we're seeing them not participating much. But will this news make any change at all? 
have always said one thing. The market is a discounting mechanism. It prices in everything. You don't be even shocked, don't be shocked that even this news, uh, the market has actually priced in most of this uh, because for such news to have come out, we, we ought to have seen a market rally, but no, we have not seen it. So the market has already taken in cognizance what is going to happen. And take note that uh, it might not be good news for the present administration in terms of negative thought, but if you look at the index today, um, this, it's under this government that we've seen an all-time high, historical all-time high of, on the beginning, the inception of the stock market. So I think um, they should give them time. With time, I think there are a lot of positive things that might come up for the country and the market Uh, positive, um, and uh, I think we'll not see positive inputs already in, in which we are seeing in the market. But I think it's a long term thing. Um, um, we need to watch and see what happens next. Okay. But so far, no matter how the corrections of the market is going to be, I don't see it going down much. Um, from the trend, we are still seeing, we expect more, uh, more rallies to the top. Okay, because when we were, some people I spoke to earlier uh, last month, where, where one of the troubles they raised was, oh, Nigeria's got so much potential, we've got people to invest, but how do we tell them about this potential if they're having trouble repatriating their funds? So if this problem is resolved, it will be a great one for the country. We do hope that's true. So thank you so much, uh, Abdul Rashid Mama. But before I let you go, very quickly, how do you think the market is going to close today? Will it reverse? Will it be bullish or will it be bearish? No, no, no. That rally was too high. It needs to cool down. The market, it's, uh, we call it, when when the car overheats, it needs to rest. So the market needs to take a rest for for now. So that we don't blow up the whole scenario. You understand? So the market needs to rest. For every rally, there will always be a correction. For every staircase you climb, there will always be a landing. So this is what we're experiencing now. The market needs to take their rest. Thank you so, so that there will be more. Yeah, to have the momentum to move to I mean to the next level. Thank you so much, Abdul Rashid Momo, equity trader, TRW stockbrokers, for sharing your insights on business incorporated. Thank you. Now let's go over to the Middle East where markets are still having it good. Abu Dhabi, let's see how that performed. 0.61% up at intraday. Very green for the markets. Now Dubai also following very closely with a 0.6% uptick. Elsewhere, let's see Saudi. Saudi is up 0.65% as well. Also in that region, and we see Qatari index speeding up there with a 1.39% uh, uptick for that region very well for the equities now let's see what's happening still in london the world's first ai safety summit which kicked off yesterday uh, is still ongoing or today's ending today but with delegates from all over the world having a say and they reached an agreement they actually signed uh, a pact today to you know foresee or to oversee to make sure that ai is safe for all let's hear more from wada imran from berlin there she has details of that uh wada what what exactly did they come you know what agreement did they come to today at the ai summit Yes, thanks for having me. Delegates from 28 countries who are in London at the summit have agreed to work together to limit the risks posed by AI. The US and China are both very important countries when discussing this since China has been the hub for much technological, technological innovation. China's stance at the summit was that they really want to contribute to regulating AI. The Vice Minister of Science and Technology of China said that AI technology is uncertain, unexplainable, and lacks transparency. In the same way, the U.S. has called for faster movement. They're outlining the dangers of AI and that regulation measures should come much faster. The host country, the U.K., says AI safety is so important because it impacts the coming generations. India, however, is optimistic. It sees AI as the next big opportunity and has a vision for it to be trustworthy and safe and regulated. 
And yes, despite basically being on opposite sides for most things, China and the US are side by side in their vision for AI. Even the UK and the US, which are both racing to develop regulations, agree on this. The UK has a rather more patient approach. They want to know more about the tech, but the US is more aggressive. US President Joe Biden has already signed an executive order. His AI policy will come out before the EU's. Well, what about the tech companies? Uh, we do know that they benefit, some of them, most of them benefit from this. Uh, what are the tech leaders, what are their thoughts about this? Well, two names come to mind who are both in attendance. Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, who gave us the new toy ChatGPT, and Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla and SpaceX. Altman and Musk both share the view that AI is dangerous when unregulated. Both say it can get our civilization in trouble and even disrupt daily life, which I guess it kind of already has. AI unregulated can result in, for example, students cheating in schools, jobs becoming more redundant. Musk will also host a live stream today with UK's Rishi Sunak on X, formerly known as Twitter, to share some thoughts on this topic. Musk himself has launched an AI business called X.AI. But both tech leaders, Musk and Altman, are in support of coming up with a framework that helps reap more benefits than not from this ever-growing technology. But some small or mid-sized tech companies or even AI startups like Iris AI are missing from the conversation. So let's talk about the markets now. What are investors watching out for? Well, after yesterday's indication from the U.S. Federal Reserve that the U.S. was making progress on inflation and expectations of inflation, market observers and analysts are betting that this may be the end of interest rate peak. And we can expect interest rate cuts in the coming, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Some important data expected from the U.S. today is from tech giant Apple. Investors will be focused on whether Apple took a strong start or not with their new iPhone 15 sales. Germany has also important data coming out today, including unemployment numbers, which will be interesting to note. Currently, this European country is looking for more workers. The three main indexes in New York rallied, with Nasdaq, S&P 500 up more than 1%. Thank you so much, uh, Wada Imran, Deutsche Welle's correspondent there in Berlin for the update. Now let's turn our attention now to early trade in the U.S. where S&P 500 futures inched higher today as investors shifted focus from the Federal Reserve's policy decision to the latest batch of corporate earnings reports. S&P 500 futures rose 0.51% as Nasdaq 100 futures gained 0.79%. But we'll look at the Dow, the futures tied to the Dow Jones. It was up today as well, 0.35%. Solar Edge tumbled more than 18% after posting an unexpected loss and offering dismal guidance for fourth quarter revenue. DoorDash climbed more than 7% on earnings that surpassed Wall Street's forecast, while Etsy fell 5% after management warned of a challenging environment for consumer discretionary spending. The moves follow a winning session on Wall Street that also marked the start of a new trading month. Now let's see how Asia market performed. It rose sharply with South Korea in the lead as investors took comfort from the U.S. Federal Reserve's decision to leave its benchmark interest rates unchanged. Japan's Nikkei 225 gained 1.1% and finished at 31,949 points. We've seen it extending gains from Wednesday. Now the topics index added 0.5%. Now hitting a free of a fresh three-week high and notching a three-day winning streak. South Korea's KOSPI, however, jumped 1.81%, leading gains in Asia and closing at 2,343 points. Meanwhile, the country's data showed consumer prices accelerated for the third time in the month. Now, we'll move over to the global oil market space now, where oil prices edged higher in early trade on Thursday as a conflict in the Middle East kept investors on edge. Uh, about whether it's, it could disrupt oil supplies around the region. Uh, Brent crude futures rose uh, 38 cents at $85, one cent a barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures gained 46 cents at $80.90 a barrel. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, called on Muslim states to seize oil and food exports to Israel 
demanding an end to its bombardment of the Gaza Strip. Uh, according to state media, Iran, a member of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, produced around 2.5 million barrels per day of crude in 2022, and that's according to the U.S. energy data. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. Now, global prices of vegetable oil have been on the decline in 2023, with the prices of rapeseed oil falling to $1,045 per ton in the third quarter of 2023, a 32.74% decline from $1,567 per ton in the corresponding quarter of 2022. Now, some flower seed oil prices also fell below $900 per ton for the first time since mid-2020 in September this year. However, the price of 5-liter vegetable oil in Nigeria spiked by 44% to 13,000 naira year on year, more than the current food inflation rate of 30.64%. Tomiwa Jewale, analyst financial derivatives company, joins us to explain this. Hi, Tomiwa, what is responsible for this divergence in prices? And with the Christmas season approaching, a period of high demand for vegetable oil, are prices likely to continue rising? Yes, so in line with the fall in global food prices, uh, the prices of vegetable oil in the global market have been declining in 2023, driven mainly by increased supply. You know, Russia and Ukraine are top producers of um, sunflower seed oil, and the massive stockpile that amassed in the Black Sea region at the inception of the world is now finding its way into global markets. Also, in the 2022-2023 season, there was a global record level of production of sunflower seed oil and also rapeseed oil, which helped to uh, put down prices. However, in Nigeria, yeah, vegetable oil was, is part of the list of forex ban list of the CBN in 2015, which has reduced um, the level of imported vegetable oil into the country. Although domestic production has increased by 11.5% to 2.04 million, ton million tons currently from 2019, there's still supply deficits to meet the demand for vegetable oil in the country. And then when you take into the fact that the agricultural products that are used in the production of this vegetable oil are mainly in the northern region, where you have a high level of insecurity, adverse weather condition, plus the increasing level of logistics cost in the country, they, you see that the prices begin to increase. So those are the factors that have led to um, increase in price. And with the upcoming um, festive season, Christmas season, as demand increases, prices are most likely to remain high. So the other oils such as canola oil, Tomiwa, which are considered healthier, are also more expensive. What alternatives can consumers explore? Yes, so as the popular dish says, health is wealth. But, you know, with um, inflation of an over 18 year inflation rate of 26.7% in September, high multi dimensional poverty, and a reducing purchasing power, most Nigerians now are more price conscious than health conscious. However, some of these types of vegetable oils, such as soybean oil, um, do pose a risk to health challenges due to the high level of saturated fats, while the more healthy ones, such as canola oil, olive oil, have a good balance of, um, of omega 6 and omega 3 fatty acids. But you know, when it comes to terms to balance um cost and health um and health concerns, um palm oil has emerged as a suitable alternative for um, vegetable oil production. So we're looking at palm oil now as the next big thing, Tommy. Well, but in October, that's just last month, the Central Bank of Nigeria, that's the CBN, lifted the ban on 43 items uh, which were, you know, on the no import list or for access to forex, including vegetable oil. But now with that um, lifting, will this affect, uh, will this lead to a decrease in the price of vegetable oil? Do we see Oil, oil prices in Nigeria, especially vegetable oil prices, decreasing as a result of this? You know, ideally, as importers now gain more access to um, forex um, supply and are able to import more, there should be an increased supply, which should help to reduce um, prices of vegetable oil. But you know, there are concerns about the level of forex supply in the country currently, which could help, to, which could actually um, diminish the expected um, increase in supply. Also, most imported products in the country right now are having an increase in price due to um, foreign exchange rates pass through. So even at this point, even if there's more, if there's access to forex, you know, they are still going to um, import it at a high cost level and still, so they're still going to make prices increase. So although in the long term, when uh, um, the exchange rate begins to stabilize, we might see a fall in vegetable prices. During the short term, prices are most likely to remain high.
So you're saying that those who produce locally have nothing to fear, even as this ban is lifted, that even if their production, because a lot of them are worried that their, their production in terms of, they would, that will stifle production in the country as, you know, the borders, as the import, you know, restriction has been lifted. Do you think this is going to impact in any way those who produce locally, Tomiwa? Yes, definitely. As I said, in the long run, you know, when the exchange rate stabilizes and there's increased supply, you have competitors, you know, so by the time consumers have a high level of, um, of, so of substitutes or have a level of options, you know, we begin to see competition, which is going to bring down prices. So that might actually be, uh, for local producers, that might be a disadvantage to them. Okay, so thank you so much, Tommy Wa, um, Ajay Wale, Analyst Financial Derivatives, for sharing your insights on the program. Thank you. Now, moving on to other stories, Ethiopia says it plans to produce 9.8 billion liters of milk in 2023 and the 2024 fiscal year out of cattle, camel and goat uh, milk. And that's according to the Ministry of Agriculture. The ministry adds that in order to achieve the plan, the government is working on problem solving strategies such as improving breed cattle, ensuring safe fodder and improving marketing linkage. Also, awareness creation would be applied in relation to how to feed cattle, what kind of fodder should be used and other related tax. Now, South Africa's finance minister, Enoch Godongwana, says the country's debt is growing faster than the economy. It would need an additional 14 billion rands to pay off, you know, that debt, tabling the medium-term budget policy statement in the National Assembly today. Uh, he says that the country's debt now stands at 5.2 trillion rands and will exceed the 6 trillion rands mark by 2025. Dr. Elmer uh, Moman, head of South Africa's economic research at Standard Bank, says the economy has not grown fast enough to support increasing expenditure of the current debt levels. Let's take a listen. The budget was broadly in line with our expectation. The biggest adjustment was on the revenue side, where companies came under pressure, partly from lower commodity prices and partly from the higher cost of doing business as they had to overcome the impact of electricity load shedding, generating their own electricity, and then of course the shortcomings in the logistics sector. At the same time, we had some overspending on the wage bill. This was counteracted by savings elsewhere. In other words, what Treasury did was to force departments to absorb the extra cost of their wages elsewhere except that they've exempted some of the service delivery focused sectors from these savings. This would include education, healthcare and police. In other words, it's a very pragmatic budget. It's very reasonable based on very realistic assumptions. And we think that it was a very pragmatic approach to absorb the additional fiscal pressures in this way. Unfortunately, government is also signaling that there will be some tax increases next year to the tune of around 15 billion rand. This is reasonably small in the overall scheme of things, but we suspect that this may also fall on the consumer as one of the easier way of achieving this would be via fiscal drag. In other words, not adjusting um, tax brackets for individuals by inflation. Hmm. That's a many struggle for many African countries in terms of the budget. Well, that's a wrap on Business Incorporated today. I'm Will Ibang. Thanks for watching.